Hello, everyone. Welcome to Asian Voices. I'm Michael Doden. Thank you for joining us for the NHK World TV debate, Measuring Our Lives. Today, we stand at a turning point for the whole concept of growth. As globalization has spread, we have focused on a type of growth where GDP is the only metric of consequence. However, governments and international organizations are now questioning today if GDP adequately or accurately reflect the happiness and well-being of people. A new vision of growth is required, and today we will discuss this with a diverse panel of experts. And let me introduce our panelists to you. To my left is Mr. Lintaro Tamaki, Deputy Secretary General for the OECD. In 2011, the OECD published the Your Better Life Index, introducing, thank you, introducing metrics focusing on more than just GDP figures. Prior to joining the OECD, Mr. Tamaki was Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs at the Ministry of Finance, Japan. And Mr. Liu Shenzhen, Executive De Deputy Director, CEIBS, Liu Chiaqi Institute of International Finance, China. He is dedicated to China's economic reform and is a popular microblogger in China as well. And then uh, Dr. Rajiv Bhargava, Director and Senior Fellow, Center for the Study of Developing Societies, India. Uh, Dr. Bhargava is an expert on political theory. He advocates social and economic equality as a basis for sustainable economic and societal growth. And Mr. Dov Seidman, founder and chief executive officer, LRN. LRN helps hundreds of companies to develop ethical corporate cultures and inspire principled performances in business. Thank you all for joining us. No, I must say our topic today, measuring our lives, is rather a challenging topic to address under, this, un, under the time constraint. But my first question is to you, Mr. Tamaki. Uh, OECD has developed a new matrix which involves um, far more than just GDP figures. It uses 11 dimensions aside from economic growth and also evaluates different types of growth. Now, what is this matrix trying to achieve and what does the index reveal that we did not know already? <laughs> um, let me start with a background. Uh, of course, we are still in the process of uh, recovery from 2008 financial crisis. And uh, the prevailing sentiment is that uh, globalization and economic growth have not benefited all groups of the society. At the time when governments are de designing strategy to restore economic growth, we need to respond to these aspirations and to place economic growth within the broader, much broader context of societal, societal progress. There is a growing consensus that we put too much emphasis on economic, uh, economic as say, measuring economic production and not enough on establishing what truly matters to people. And too many important policy decisions are still being taken with, on the basis of GDP or per capita GDP as a sole driver. GDP will continue to play, of course, as a pivotal role, but we need to contemplate it within that major well-being more broadly. And OECD, my organization, um, published uh, this publication last year. Uh, the, it has led almost for over a decade the international reflection on the measurement of well-being and progress. As you said, uh, this House Life publication or I'll say your Better Life initiative includes indexing the quality of life and progress of society in the 11 fields, like in our job, uh, education, health, uh, community, etc. This is still on the way to elaborating it. And the final purpose of, uh, of establishing this kind of index is to make it useful to decision make, policy decision making. I noticed that you used the word like well being and better life instead of happiness. You know, what is the 
thinking behind it? Um, quite often, particularly in Japanese translation, it is in, in, uh, translated into happiness, measuring happiness. But this is, of course, measuring um, some a quality of life, but not measuring spiritual or sentimental happiness. Um, perhaps and this is a quite, quite prevailing misunderstanding. The, yeah, the most part of uh, uh, the, the indicators are more material one. Uh -huh. And something that are uh, measurable, mm. in a sense. I see. And Dr. Liu, uh, what is your view of OECD's uh, matrix? You know, China you know, dominates the market using, for example, low labor costs to break into foreign exports. But there is a limit to the size of any market. Um, so um, a growth strategy focused purely on a larger pie will inevitably hit a dead end. Would I be right in saying that? Uh, yes, I think that in the past, uh, the Chinese economy has been growing very fast. Uh, but sometimes uh, we are forgetting uh, the ultimate goal of the economy. Uh, in the past, I think the government had put forward some slogan, like we need to improve the living standard of the people. Uh, basically, that means GDP. Uh, in the early stage of the Chinese economic growth, I think this is extremely important because at, in the first several decades in, for China, we have a lot of you know, uh, social uh, problems and uh, the economy is very poor. And the, the, the most urgent task is to improve the economy uh, and especially people's living standard. But nowadays, I think uh, we are coming to uh, a new turning point uh, because the current eco economic growth model uh, has caused uh, a huge uh, social cost. Uh, the major cost uh, comes from the pollution problem. Uh, actually, now, everybody in China, they are worried about, worrying about their food safety problem. And also we see that pollution will cause a lot of diseases in the future. This is the inevitable uh, outcome. So this is a short-term and uh, long-term balance. In the short-term, everybody wants to make more money. But if you have a long-term long, long -term horizon, probably your today's money uh, is at a higher cost of the future for your house. Mm -hmm. So for China as a, as a country, we need to rethink about the goal of our economy. And also, I think uh, uh, the, the ultimate goal of the economy should be people's happiness. But happiness is something not only related to economic growth level, uh, but also uh, to other factors like the life quality and also I think the, uh, uh, the feeling of fairness is most important. Uh, by fairness, I, I don't mean that the fairness of outcome. Uh, even in the United States, in most countries, you know, uh, income inequality is, uh, is something, uh, actually is a natural result of uh, you know, competition. Uh, but here, uh, opportunity fairness is uh, indispensable. If you don't have fair, fair opportunity fairness, the people, they will feel uh, they were unfairly treated. They will lose their support and their patience. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think we now, uh, to be frank, we are facing a big problem of uh, uh, corruption issue. Basically, corruption means uh, somebody, uh, they can make money by, pri by privilege. And uh, this is unfair to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is uh, another big challenge for China's current economy. Uh -huh. Thank you. And we will go into that, uh, the social uh, issues later on as well. And Dr. Balgava, what about India? Um, like China, India mm -hmm. also has made a huge uh, progress thanks to um, growth based on GDP uh, boosting strategy perhaps. But will India continue to prioritize a GDP based growth model or is there a kind of realization that there's got to be something else than that? Yeah, well I think the first point that I want to make is that uh, getting rid of poverty for everybody is an absolutely uh, necessary condition of any any idea of collective well-being. I mean, uh, poverty is a source of profound unhappiness. It is a source of uh, a complete lack of well-being. Uh, you have disease, you have sickness, you are exposed to extreme heat and cold, and so on. I mean, there's, there's nothing, uh, it's, a, it's a curse. Mm. So, uh, the, everywhere, uh, 
people should be getting rid of poverty. And if GDP is some indicator of, of uh, the removal of poverty, then I wouldn't say there's anything particularly wrong with the idea of GDP. However, as we know, prosperity, even if it's distributed well, which actually the GDP figures don't always uh, reveal, even when everybody gets a fair amount, prosperity in itself is not going to give us happiness or won't give us well-being. And, and one of the things which is wrong with this whole idea of GDP is actually the notion of measure itself, which is being used here. Measure here is, is to give a number, is to quantify uh, something. Uh, and that is entirely inappropriate when we are trying to measure lives or measure good lives. I think there's another sense of measure which is, which is much more appropriate, uh, and that is when we, when we say man is the measure of all things, or man is the measure of, of man, or, or uh, honesty is a true measure of man, where we mean uh, not something that is quantifiable, but what we mean here is that we are judging the quality of, a, of, of something in this case, uh, a, a virtue, a, quali a, a, a quality of a person, or a quality of a society, by reference to a standard or an ideal of what is truly good. And, and it's that sense of measure that we're using the term measure when we're talking about measuring lives. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, both these points, in my view, uh, are, are extremely uh, pertinent uh, to uh, all those societies which are uh, getting out of... Uh, uh, of uh, a state of uh, uh, poverty and underdevelopment and moving to, uh, to, a, to a state of, of relative, uh, you know, uh, prosperity. Thank you. And Mr. Seidman, you are a CEO and a moral philosopher and an entrepreneur, and obviously you wear many hats, and I hope you are wearing all of them today. <laughs> Um, so, what are your thoughts on this issue of measuring our lives? We're here to have a debate, but Rajiv, those comments very much resonate with me. Uh, stepping back philosophically, I, I think this issue is so critical because in my experience of 20 years working with global companies, trying to help them wrestle with this issue of can we pursue revenue and growth and be responsible? Can we pursue profits and be principled along the way? Uh, this issue is critical now more than ever, but we need to step back and acknowledge that we manage what we measure. But what we measure is a choice, and it reveals what we value, and it reveals our values. And if we're really going to get to the essence of the issue, we have to learn to measure the values that animate uh, everything. Now, let's just make this very personal. If one of you had a crisis, or a friend came to you in crisis and said, I'm in crisis, I need $10,000 you would say, if you trust them, here, or you'd say, how are you living and how can I help you get back on track? You wouldn't say, how about I give you six, right? At personal relationship, it's, it's about how. But anytime we scale at a national level, it's how much GDP. We spend three years debating how much stimulus, not how we're going to stimulate the economy. The next UX election is going to be about how many jobs are going to be created in September and October. How much revenue, market share, how much debt can our balance sheets hold? In the new economy, how many followers, how many friends, how many click-throughs, how many impressions, how much, how much, how much? Now, even though life is about how. And I think that let's see what this looks like in practice. Netflix, a rising company, and China later this year is going to have its version of Netflix, Jaflix, right? So Netflix is thinking they're about to take over. All these subscribers, counting how much subscribers... They do a little price increase, and 800,000 people came together in unison and left in 48 hours and crashed the company. They were measuring how much, how many subscribers, but not how loyal. And I think that we are now in a time where we need to do two things. We need to have a deep debate about what are the right metrics. But more importantly, we need to recognize that metrics and our endeavors have a philosophical paradox. The most ancient paradox in philosophy is the paradox of happiness, that if you pursue happiness directly, it eludes you. Mm -hmm. But if you do things that you're passionate about, that are meaningful to you, that make a difference in the lives of others, happiness can find you. So even after we pick the right metrics, 
If we pursue these metrics directly, they will go away. If we pursue success in business, in politics, they will elude us. So I think the way forward is to decide that even though this is what we want, let's have a more deeper relationship with those very things that enable us to create these things on a prosperous, sustainable uh, basis. The reason, and I'm going to wrap up, the reason this is so critical is the world is not just connected. It's not just interconnected, it's interdependent. One vegetable vendor can make a revolution in the Middle East. When we are rising and falling together, when we are in an interdependent, morally interdependent relationship, we need to begin to measure the ways how we create trust in our relationships, how we affect each other, how we relate to each other, and how we are personal with each other at a national, global, business, and personal level. Okay. Just, just to clarify on one point, uh, it's not that uh, probing ways to uh, devise um, indexes, in yeah. indices for happiness is not our aim, is it? I mean, happiness should be the outcome, as you Happiness say. has to be the outcome. Yeah. Here's a painful example. We think we have a jobs crisis. I don't think we have a jobs crisis. Clearly, we don't have enough jobs. We have a careers crisis. Seven out of ten people on the job collecting a paycheck are not engaged, and two out of the seven are disengaged. So we keep measuring how many jobs, not how much people care on the job, so we're measuring the wrong thing. So we need to have the right relationship between the metric and those things that bring that metric about in a sustainable way. Now, talking about this happiness or well-being, um, Dr. Bhargava, you have said that uh, while happiness or well-being tends to be defined um, from a sort of an individual point of view, you are focused more on the relationship between the individual and society and how individuals relate to society. And that um, resonates to what uh, Mr. Seidman has just elaborated, I think. But could you elaborate your idea in the context of measuring our lives? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, it's, it's very important to have resources uh, because it's only through resources that you, that you achieve uh, anything whatsoever. But once you have these resources, you must also have the skill to do something with those resources. I mean, that's a point that was made by people like Amartya Sen, that, uh, that it, what matters even more than having resources is what you do with them what, and how you integrate them into your lives, how you turn them into your skills. But that, again, is not sufficient. The skills that you achieve and which you integrate into your life have to be seen in a broader perspective. Uh, we, we have to find out how they, f they, they fit appropriately in the kind of life that we want to lead. And for that, it's extremely important to have some idea of what the ends of life are. Unless you have some clarity on, on what it is that defines or what, what it is that gives purpose or meaning or point to a life, there's no point in even acquiring skills. Now, all this is all very, you know, all this so can be... In the be context of relation with others? Exactly. Uh, all, this, all this is, you know, in, in some senses... You can see it uh, from a purely individualistic point of view. I'm not denying that this is not important. It's extremely important. But I think what this misses out on is how much we depend on others mm -hmm. and how much our well-being depends on the quality of social relations we have, whether it is uh, in the smallest possible context, namely that of our family, uh, in our friendship and companionship, and or in a larger community how much it matters that we are recognized appropriately, mm -hmm. how much it would really matter to us uh, in a negative way if we were demeaned or degraded or humiliated. In other words, our sense of self-esteem, our sense of self-respect, and our basic self-confidence in some ways is highly dependent on other people. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that means good. that if all these dimensions are no. absolutely crucial, to a sense of well-being, right. then you cannot even conceive what it is to have well-being without there being some understanding of 
what is it to have well, a well-being me... in, collect, you know, in a collective? Right. Yeah. Well, let me follow up on that point and sort of broaden the idea, because I'm sure Mr. Seidman has something to say regarding that. Uh, you emphasise that it is vital to have a, you know, for private sectors, an environment where employees uh, share the company values and work towards the goal of contributing to it. Now, can this idea also be applied to, to society as a whole, a kind of shared sense of mission or sense of hope in your vocabulary? It's funny you say uh, hope. Uh, in business, men, uh, how many of you have heard the expression, uh, hope is not a strategy, I want an analytic plan? Uh, hope is the greatest strategy ever known to mankind. When people are inspired in the value of hope, they lean into the world. They see the world uh, as full of possibility. They see others in the world as people they can relate with and do things together. When they don't have hope, they lean out of the world. They despair, and you can't innovate and move forward. Yet we don't necessarily know how should we lead to inspire hope in people. How do we measure the level of hopes? Because when hope is low, people aren't going to forge ahead. I want you to know that we uh, did an independent study of two million observations of behaviors in large and small companies, for-profit, not-profit, some governments, uh, and we looked at two million behaviors of 36,000 people in 18 countries, including Japan and China and India. And I've got some good news and bad news to tell you. This is an independent study of statistical analysis. The bad news is that only 3% of organizations were, were, are what we call self-governing. They were truly, they didn't just have values, Decisions were animated by values. They abounded in trust, and they had a sense of mission and not just profit that drove them. Only 3%. Those that could create that company had so much more how much from focusing on the how. They had much more innovation, customer dissatisfaction by dramatic levels, uh, employee engagement, financial performance, and they had, because they had more trust, they had 22 times the level of risk-taking that leads to innovation, because you don't innovate without taking a risk. Speaking in a meeting is taking the risk that someone's going to think you're not that smart. So if you, take, if you have trust, you take risk to innovate and create progress. And I think that this is an enormous opportunity. If 97% of organizations are not truly values-based, imagine if we did values and got the how much as an outcome of that, and the journey we can go on to scale not just revenue and profit and debt and market share, but we scaled our values because we did the hard work of translating our values into societal, corporate, and organizational practices and behaviors and leadership behaviors that you can observe and measure and incent and celebrate and get more of those and then get the outcomes. Mm, I see. Now, Dr. Liu, um, talking about values or ideas uh, of what direction society uh, should go in has perhaps uh, been changing in recent years in China. It may have been uh, Confucius ideas uh, long ago, or uh, perhaps uh, even communists no longer seem to form the basis of a shared um, concept of society. If that was the case, then what shared ideal or value of society do the Chinese people today hold to make them go forward? Uh, to be frank, nowadays the Chinese people, uh, the only value is money. Uh, people believe in nothing be but uh, money. <laughs> For thousands of years, I think this is the first time. Because in the past, we believe in uh, Confucius, we also believe in Buddhism. But because of the uh, cultural revolution, it changed many things. And also after China's uh, opening up and reform, uh, we, uh, the market economy, uh, people realize the importance of making money. Uh, this is good, but, uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, we forget our traditional values. That's why we see there are so many uh, uh, difficult to understand social problems. Uh, when people they get uh, uh, injured in the street, nobody dare to help you. Uh, this is a social uh, trust crisis now. We, we, and uh, for society, I think, if we don't have real belief, people have nothing to dare. And uh, that explains, partly explains, why uh, there are so many people they are making uh, pointless food uh, for, other, for other customers. Uh, without, without a value, our society uh, is difficult to reach a status of harmonious. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I think this is a big problem for China. We need to uh, try to restore uh, our traditional values or beliefs. But where to find? I think, uh, of course, Confucius is, uh, uh, is a possible uh, possibility. And also, I think uh, Buddhism uh, can be something also uh, uh, important for the Chinese society. I also noticed that uh, for this Davos uh, conference, we also invited a uh, a Buddhism religion leader mm -hmm. uh, from Taiwan to join the forum. I think this is very good because, uh, uh, the, for the especially for the mainland Chinese people, we need we now we need to think more about making money. We need to think, you know, uh, the true meaning of our lives. Mm -hmm. No, Mr. Tamaki, of course, yes. On this, um, not on the Bali, but uh, I like to say, the OECD is not proposing. Um, composite life index, um, unique composite life index, but uh, we are aiming at to establish a, a kind of interactive index. Um, the weight given to each topic, for example, for some, education is quite crucial, others, life, life, work life balance is more important. So we are aiming at uh, to change the weight among various indicators mm -hmm. uh, so according to societal or cultural background or say individual conditions. So we are calling this, this index, not <coughs> OECD um, Better Life Index, but your Better Life Index. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that you can mm -hmm. sort of adapt yes. and apply yes. to your... You can access from from website uh -huh. and change your balance, let's say weight, uh -huh among uh, indicators. I see. But what, what are your thoughts on the um, opinions and uh, viewpoints expressed by our um, panelists here today because having read the OECD uh, index um, I did get the impression that uh, there was only sort of one topic for value in community and it does not seem as if there is a explicit uh, emphasis on them as a goal as a goal would I be right in saying that um, so, say social connectedness for example mm. is an, uh, we are now establishing a series of statistics. So some indicators are quite easy to wow. take um, as an indicator, I take on a statistics, but others not very easy. Um, another example is an, uh, um, one subjective indicator, uh, life satisfaction survey. Quite surprisingly, uh, compelling indicators in my country, Japan, um, most of the indicators Japan is above or say at the level of uh, OECD average. But the exception is life satisfaction. Always life satisfaction in Japan is below average of OECD. Mm -hmm. This is also the case in Korea. We are wondering why. This is an issue to be discussed, but uh, mm -hmm. one possibility is a uh, cultural, cultural bias not to say I'm so happy to the outsider and to recognize ourselves as a quite happy man, mm -hmm. a happy woman. Well, if I uh, may follow up you on, on that, follow, ask a follow up question on that, um, you have been at the forefront of uh, policy making in Japan yourself, uh, a mature economy yeah. uh, that has experienced very slow uh, GDP growth for around 20 years so far. Um, how do you evaluate the state of Japan today in terms of well-being? Uh, <laughs> um, sitting in Paris and looking at my home country, um, I feel how Japan is important in the global economy and the global, the global itself. And we are wishing quick recovery from earthquake and uh, say quick recovery from financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, Looking at um, this house life exercise in the context of Japan, Japan has uh, several major strengths, particularly uh, well-educated people and a decent and homogeneous lifestyle, like quality of life. But to make, to maintain the standard of living and to improve the quality of, the quality of life further, I have to say Japan should undertake another series of reforms quickly. And the keystone is, of course, tax and social security reform to um, 
to sustain and pin the public finance confidence, confidence on the sustainability of public finance. This is a really crucial element for the future of Japan. But also, we see, I see, um, say, the necessity of integrating Japanese economy more yeah. into global economic system and labor market reform and others. Mm -hmm. I see. Perhaps uh, the, the need for us is to sort of um, try and measure our own lives uh, and not just talk about the reform. Yes. Uh, hoping that the world will yes. somehow go back to what it used to be before. Yeah, I'll say without <laughs> being uh, self-complacent. Mm -hmm. mm. see. No, um, Dr. Liu, you have um, talked about the, the disparity or the unfairness that exists in the society today. Um, you know, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, in his speech at this forum, highlighted uh, economic disparity as the major challenge that China has had to tackle. Um, th there have been ideas or national slogans, though, as um, harmonious society or a society with um, enough for all. But as China approaches a change in leadership, how will China uh, deal with the pers persisting disparity problem so that growth becomes sustainable? Uh, yes, the uh, widening wealth gap is a big threat to China's stability nowadays. Uh, I think the Chinese government has realized that uh, it is important uh, to uh, take further reform in the income distribution. Uh, but this is a very uh, tough issue because the, uh, fundamentally speaking, uh, the, uh, the root reason for today's uh, income inequality comes from the fact that the government is too powerful. Uh, now we have the, probably we have the largest government in the Chinese history, uh, not only in terms of the number of employees, but also in terms of the power it, it has. Uh, it controls many large SOEs, and the SOE, again, the monopoly uh, in many industries. And also, in the past several years, we see the government's fiscal revenue has been increasing two or three times of the GDP growth rate, uh, which means the, the government can choose more and more resources. But we know in an economy, there are three parts, the individuals, the companies, and the government. But it is individuals and the companies that really create the uh, values and the wealth. The government is nothing but a cost. Uh, so, uh, which means the government, the smaller the, is the government, the better. Uh, and also because the government now, nowadays, the government is so deeply involved in economic activities. This creates a big opportunity for corruption. Uh, uh, now, many local governments, they are becoming, not government, they are becoming big companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they build big projects. They are, uh, they are so deeply involved in, uh, in the economic activities that they, the local officials, they are becoming, uh, not officials, they are becoming the CEOs of big companies. Uh, that's why we see uh, there are so many uh, corruption cases associated with economic activities, especially uh, in the real estate, uh, real estate sector, in the stock market, and also in the uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, so if China wants to solve the income inequality, uh, we must reform our current government system. Mm -hmm. uh, to be brief, the government must give the power and the money back to the people. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we in the stock market, you know, uh, financing, uh, financing should be the rights for all companies because every, every company needs the capital. But in China, IPO is becoming a privilege. Uh, only if you have a, a special relationship or you try to get some special relationship, it is possible uh, to make IPO easily. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, uh, this creates a lot of dis uh, distortion uh, in China. Right. And also I think we, the, the government need to reduce the tax. And also they need to uh, take further reform with, S with SOE. Uh, because many SOE, they are not creating value. They are uh, wasting money. Mm -hmm. uh, and also inside the SOE, we see so many corruption uh, cases. I see, I see. Well, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to squeeze two questions into one, and that, this question is for Mr. Seidman. Um, Dr. Liu talked about the um, disparity issue and also the sort of ethical behavior required on the part of the 
the CEOs or the companies. Mm -hmm. um, U.S., although we tend to think of U.S. as a developed economy, a rich country, um, it also faces a serious disparity within the country. And you emphasize the importance of uh, leadership in achieving better mm -hmm. growth. Yeah. Um, w what are the roles for the leadership there? Well, it's a great question. And, and putting this into context, uh, leadership used to manage people when we tried to shift their behavior. If you give me enough carrots and sticks, I could get someone to come to a factory and act like a quasi-robot, to do the same job over and over and over and over again. When you live in an interdependent social world, we are asking people to elevate their behavior. And leadership is no longer about shifting your behavior. Instead of carrying your suitcase, wheel your suitcase, don't drink coffee, drink a cappuccino. We are now in a time where we are asking of people to elevate, be responsible, be principled, defend your company on Facebook, collaborate with people in a globally interconnected world who come from a different culture, have pride in your company. You can't pay for pride. You can't scare people. You can't say, you go in a room and don't come out until you innovate. And you two go in a room and don't come out until you have an idea. Now, the only way to elevate another human being is with a mission worthy of their commitment and dedication, with values that inspire them uh, and, and guide them. So leadership today is, has to go on a journey from formal authority, listen to me because I'm the boss, or if I'm a country, listen to me because I have more uh, tanks or listen to me because I have more oil, or listen to me because I have more land. Leadership has to go on a journey from exercising power over people to exercising power through people, which comes through values, and it's a shift from formal authority to moral authority. Leadership that itself is rooted in values, where people believe in you because first and foremost you're principled. I want to mention one leader at this conference. Uh, Paul Pullman, who's one of the, the mentors here, the CEO of Unilever, he and I had a conversation not too long ago. And he was asking me not an academic question, but a business strategy operational question. He, sat, he said to me, hey, Dove, it took them 17 days to get rid of Mubarak. And Mubarak had a military. I don't have a military at Unilever. What if my consumers and my employees didn't like something about how we were behaving or running the company? Leaders like that are our future because they are willing to step back and rethink their leadership itself and go on a journey to translate this moral authority into how they lead the company and relate to the world. And that's what gives me hope, speaking mm -hmm. of hope. Uh -huh. I see. Well, it does seem that uh, the moral leadership is all about uh, engaging people yeah. and making sure that everybody is, is on board. Um, Dr. Balgava, if I can turn to you, um, India also has a serious problem of disparity. But you have uh, spoken about uh, inclusion and exclusion, and that the society cannot be happy um, if there is a large pool of people excluded, excluded from whether it be opportunities or jobs or whatever. Perhaps you could uh, elaborate on that? Yes, uh, of course, uh, if you are excluded from uh, jobs, uh uh, uh, from uh, uh, from schooling, from education, uh, on economic grounds or on any other grounds, such as you know your culture, your language, your creed, your religion. I mean, anything which is anything like this, which becomes the basis of exclusion, is bound to lead to uh, a profound uh, uh, unhappiness in the in the people who are excluded in this way. Uh, and, and therefore, it is absolutely important to build an inclusive society, to build a society where people have access in a fair and equal way to, not to, to all kinds of resources and goods which are essential for them to lead their life in the way in which they want to lead. Uh, any society where there are these completely unjust inclusions or exclusions. They're also unjust inclusions. You may be forced to assimilate when you want to stay away uh, from, from a, a certain activity, or you may be forced and coerced into, uh, to, into, even when you want to be included, you may be coerced to, 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 be, to be kept out. Uh, uh, and both, both are... Uh, both, are, uh, both have a terrible impact on, on one's sense of well-being and uh, on, on, on one's state of 
happiness and the profound sense of happiness that you know, we are talking about here. And, and these are issues that must be taken into account when we are measuring, uh, hap- measuring well-being. I see. To Mr. Tamaki, you must have something to say regarding what our panelists have said, because it does seem that um, the values like inclusive society, uh, with which uh, Dr. Bhargav have said, inclusive growth does seem to be the, the key phrase in bringing about a healthy, sustainable growth. Um, and if so, how do we incorporate that idea into the matrix of measuring our lives? Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you know, inclusiveness is a quite important element of, say, decent society we are aiming at, without any doubt. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, inclusiveness is a quite broad idea, but perhaps, uh, say, we can focus on the inequality side, of the, say, of the, say within, within countries. Uh, we shouldn't look at average number, as we did in the past, but more focusing on the distribution within the country or within the society, and look at, uh, say, uh, gender inequality, etc., and to 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 carefully uh, to more look at the details of the the reality of the society more carefully. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, the purpose of our exercise is to support the better policies, better government policies, public policies. So for that purpose. Uh, we have to elaborate more on uh, how the society, how inclusive the society is and how we could inclu- improve the inclusiveness mm-hmm. in, uh, in passing the, the policy. Aiko, can I add something? Else? I'm, a, I'm a little concerned that we're shifting to not just being inclusive, but growth. And I think the focus on growth in and of itself today is pro- problematic. Uh, we used to have boom and bust cycles every 10 to 20 years. So you're, you're in a sailboat, there's a storm, you, t- you pull down the sails, you wait, Sarbanes-Oxley, a few lawsuits, they go out of business, you're resilient for a year or two, and then you say, okay, let's go grow. And we can talk about what are we growing, GDP. When you have a tsunami one week, and a Greek bond crisis another, and a Gulf oil spill another, when you are having boom and bust cycles, not every 10 years, but every 10 days, you can no longer talk about growth. You have to talk about something new that we've never had to do before. If you're in a storm and it's never going to stop, you have to learn to sail with your sails up in a storm, meaning you have to be able to do resiliency and growth simultaneously. I think we will never again have the opportunity to just go grow. And the only thing that's ever been invented that allows people as individuals and institutions and societies to be simultaneously resilient and be able to respond to a shock and be innovative and grow are values because values control against what you should not do and values like hope allow you to not to keep going and values towards a mission propel you and I think we need to reframe the issue not how are we going to grow but how are we going to be at all times resilient and growth oriented and learn to measure those things that deliver resiliency and growth. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should also chip in, uh, in uh, just here, because when we are talking about, uh, uh, so, you know, sometimes we talk about solving the problems of the world, and uh, we think of uh, various values uh, and epistemic resources which we would use to solve the problem of the world. Now, uh, it so happens that there is only, we rely only on one tradition at the moment, I mean, there are informal ways in which we rely on other traditions, but there are basically one tradition on which we keep relying and hoping that it will you know, give us uh, some kind of perspective and some way forward in order to solve the many problems that we face together. I think that kind of uh, approach should also be in some ways uh, uh, rectified because there are a huge number of traditions in the world, you know, the African, the Asian, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indian, you know, various intellectual traditions, and they are also a source of values and a source of uh, various conceptions, and, and they have been excluded, and, 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 and that is to the detriment of, of the whole of humanity, right? So they should also be put back on the table so that we can really use all of them in order to solve some of our problems. 
Uh, I don't think we'll get a sense of well-being unless, uh, unless, these, unless there's an encounter and a real, uh, you know, healthy uh, competition and conflict between traditions uh, from, from all over the world. In other words, making use of the wisdom that are yes. out there. And, and to the extent, I think this is something which we don't uh, realize because, it's, uh, but it, because it doesn't sort of come up that strongly. But to the extent that uh, this is something which we neglect and we, we exclude, I think uh, it does continue to have a profound impact not only on the well-being of people whose resources have been neglected so far, but in the overall well-being of the whole of humanity who continue to face problems problems which cannot be solved only by one tradition, but must be solved by many. Mm, I see. Dr. Liu, um, I saw you nod. Uh, you must have something to say regarding what Dr. Bhargava say. Uh, yes, I think uh, diversity uh, is important, and also traditional values is important. Mm -hmm. For modern society, uh, especially with the uh, quick growth of market economy, uh, all over the world, I think we uh, focus too much attention on materials, on GDP. I think uh, in an in a ancient society, there are many valuable, uh, important values that probably uh, we are now we are in the process of forgetting. It is uh, the time that we try to restore these important values for modern society. Right. They're trying to sort of change the structure of society or even our mentality in how we deal with things. The one other thing that the Prime Minister Wen also highlighted in his speech was how we might tackle the environmental problems in China especially. Um, you have talked about uh, balance, balanced growth, balanced society. Um, what kind of balance is needed uh, there, do you think? Um, how must we change the structure of society in order to achieve that balance? Uh, yes, I think this is uh, a key challenge for China to balance between the environment protection and uh, the GDP growth. Uh, I think uh, to solve this problem, uh, we, need, uh, uh, we need judicial independence. Uh, because very often we see uh, the local government, they, they, they are actually protecting uh, pollution. Because many polluting companies, they are big companies, they are creating jobs, they are contributing GDP and, uh, and the revenues to the local government. So uh, because the local government, they care so much about GDP, and uh, it is very difficult for them to really enforce the, our laws. We have many laws. We have uh, uh, enough laws in environmental protection, but the law enforcement is very poor. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because the, uh, uh, at the current stage, uh, China's uh, the court system is not independent. It's actually part of the government system. So because the government care about GDP and we don't have the judicial independence, so many uh, polluting companies, they, are, they cannot be you know, seriously punished for their uh, wrong behavior. So I think to solve this problem, we need a rule of law. We need a really uh, independent you know, court system. And also the government must exit from economic activities. The government should focus on how to enforce the law. This is the responsibility of the government. I see. Well, uh, we are nearing the end of the discussion already. And before we take questions from our audience, may I ask our panelists to offer a short summary of what you see as the key takeaway from this uh, session on measuring our lives. May I start by uh, Mr. Seidman? Uh, a minute or a minute and a half. A few things. Um, if we look at the conditions in which we live, we are never going to become any less connected, interconnected, or interdependent. That is the new reality. Just because we're interdependent doesn't mean these interdependencies are healthy. We could rise together or fall together. I think we need to devote energy on a global basis to forging healthy, enduring, rich, meaningful interdependencies. And, um, and we are going to debate systems, and in this part of the world, in this regard, capitalism gets attacked. As an American, I'm comfortable saying it's not clear we ever did capitalism. Uh, most people think that Adam Smith was an economist. He was the chairman of the moral philosophy department at Glasgow University when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. People think that capitalistic competition is zero sum. I win, you lose. It comes from the tradition, uh, competition in Latin is competare. It means striving together. 
And if you strive together, everybody makes the other better. In an interdependent world, I think we have to strive together. If we are going to pursue shared value, you need shared values. It's impossible on a sustained basis to create any form of shared value unless there is an ethic of human endeavor that allows us to go together. Uh, it was 50 years ago today that John F. Kennedy gave Let's Go to the Moon speech. Today, 50 years ago. And when he said, let's go to the moon, the most important thing about his vision is not let's go to the moon. It's when he said, within a decade. He realized that the future that he wanted to bring about would take at least 10 years. He offered a vision that would outlast his presidency, and he was tragically assassinated early on, which means we're going on a journey. And since this is a panel on measurement, what do you do on journeys? First, you do what the Confucius tradition tells you to do. You take the first step. But then you measure progress, not just outcome, outcome, how much, how much. If you're on a journey, we need to agree as to what progress looks like. And if we can have that vision of healthy interdependency on a global scale and agree as to what are the metrics of progress, then we'll do those things that yield progress and have the courage to chart out 10, 20-year paths because, frankly, the problems we face today, the answers to them are not short-term. They're long-term. We need to go on a journey. And Dr. Bhargava? Yeah, <clears throat> I think we're all agreed that poverty is a curse. I think that's, uh, we have to get rid of it. We all agreed that GDP is not a sufficient indicator of well-being, although in some very you know, flimsy sense, it does indicate the potential uh, of, of, of uh, uh, what is required uh, to have collective well-being. Uh, I think uh, we all agree, and this is something which is very surprising to me, uh, we, are all, we are all agreed that, that uh, well-being is a much richer concept, that it's much more complicated business than, than many of us you know, would want to believe sometimes when we are, in, you know, as he put it, in the pursuit of you know, money and so on. Uh, there are a couple of other things which I'm not sure whether we all agree on. One is how important it is to have irreducibly social goods. There are some goods that we cannot create or enjoy individually. Take, for example, tolerant society. Now, we want to live in a tolerant society, but this is, this is not something that can be had by one individual. It has to be a collective creation. We sometimes worry about the fact that we are becoming a culture where uh, people don't read enough. Now, that's something which is not, some, which is not an, an individual's creation, nor is it something that can, we can rectify individually. If our sense of well-being is affected negatively, adversely, by the fact that we are not reading uh, enough or reading good quality stuff, this is again a collective endeavor. It is not something individual. And final point, uh, we need shared values if we are to, have, if we are to imagine the well-being of the entire humanity. But these values have multiple sources. They do not come from one single source. They have multiple sources. Many of these sources are still lying hidden. They are not even in people's views. Even, the, even those people who come from traditions which develop these values have more or less forgotten you know, what these values are. It's very important to retrieve these traditions, to reinvent and reimagine them if we are to really solve you know, what I call, uh, if, we, if we really re rediscover uh, a, a richer sense of uh, well-being that we can all, in some senses, share. Thank you. Now, I'm going to sound very unfair because I have to ask you to be briefer and shorter. Uh, Dr. Liu, what, what is your takeaway? Yeah, I think people nowadays are talking about, uh, they care too much about the uh, current economic slowing down of China. I think the real challenge is not economic slowing down. Uh, it is time for people to think about the real meaning of economic growth, to uh, really calculate the cost of the current economic growth model. Uh, of course, the government has put forward a very good plan for the next five-year plan uh, to build a sustainable economic growth model. Uh, but the real challenge is to put it into action. I think this is a, a big challenge. Thank you. Mr. Um, as we, uh, this is mostly for 
policy makers in governments who are thinking and uh, um, worrying about better policies for better lives. So for them to know the lives, people's aspiration is crucial. But uh, today, as we know today, this is a quite huge challenge, very complex issue. Secondly, um, 2015, three years' time, um, the year of target, the year of target, you know, millennium development, development goal. goal. Mm -hmm. um, so the 2015 is now approaching. So perhaps, I hope, this exercise, this type of exercise, will be contributing a lot mm -hmm. to, to elaborate some new targets beyond 2015. Right, because it's an ongoing process. Yes. So, Well, uh, let us take questions from the floor. Um, maybe two questions, uh, one there and a lady from there. Yeah. My name is Andrea, Global Shaper. And um, of course, being one of the members of the youngest community in the forum, I'm going to talk about young people. We live in a world in which more than half of the world population is under the age of 30. Um, in Asia, we've got a very big portion of this. While, for example, in Japan, we have a more aging society. That means that young people are even a scarcer resource. Now, this being said, I want to link this to the, what Maslow said. There are people who need to basically, basically satisfy their basic needs, then we go beyond this to material needs, and then we go beyond this to intellectual, aspirational, and spiritual needs. So when we are measuring, indexing what, what you uh, basically presented, we are somehow looking at what is the world population um, portion which is still in the basic needs sector, the material needs, and then they think about making money, and then the aspirational intellectual needs, and that's the 3% you mentioned. So what about investing in young people in basically moving forward directly to the last part, intellectual aspirational needs? basically using our passions to recreate a better world. Thank you. Um, any volunteers? In us? Mr. Seidman. Well, the first thing I'd say is I'm inspired by your question. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply inspired. Young people are doing something today that the world has never seen. Uh, they are creating freedom from dictators, oppressors, uh, having to listen to corporate communications, do all the talking they're talking to, freedom from micromanaging bosses, and freedom from command and control readers. And the way you create freedom from being in a box, I tell people it's not a compliment to say think outside the box. Take the box away. It's not a compliment to empower people, because when you empower someone, you say, I've got the power and I'm bestowing some on you. And young people today want to be included and participate, and they are deconstructing and doing even revolutions, and they are creating freedom from all of these things. But the real tradition that we really celebrate is not freedom from, but freedom to pursue happiness, to innovate, to rise up Maslow's hierarchy. And freedom to is always about education, inspiring people to go on a journey, and uh, frameworks of values that allow you to do something together. And I think young people are doing their part by creating the need for this freedom too. And I think leaders have to fill this vacuum and include young people on this journey, or young people will be not just angry, but they will be filled with anguish uh, and have a pain, and that will be really bad for the world. And the next question, please. Hi, I'm Jackie Wang from China. I have a question for Mr. Tamaki. Uh, your Better Life Index have anything with women's status and feeling about life in a society? And if yes, what makes women feel life better? Thank you. This is a quite uh, say evident answer. Yes, yes, we are quite mindful in measuring the, uh, the role of women in society. Uh, this is not only a participation rate in labor force, but also the uh, um, social connectedness, the social connectedness, or say education, etc. In many aspects, we could say compare the men's uh, men's data and women's group. Um, 
eventually I would say we are seeking, of course it depends upon the culture, but I say uh, we are seeking, of course, as a policy level, we are seeking total, genuine gender equality. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope that uh, you will continue the discussion perhaps in the corridors or uh, during the coffee breaks. But thank you very much for coming to the session. Now, we've debated on measuring our lives, a profound and challenging subject. And one point that all panelists uh, could agree on was the need for indices that go beyond uh, more GDP figures. Um, just as national security has taken to the individual level as human security, um, it seems that the social relations or relations between individual and individual, between individual and society, or uh, between the companies and society, will be the key word when rethinking about well-being. Well, this concludes our session. Thank you very much for your attendance, and please give a big round of applause for our panellists. Thank you very much.